our conversations that I've heard around the tables and in the hallways and uh, even in men's rooms, amen, uh, uh, where people are beginning to feel a sense of excitement and that God is indeed with us. But before I go any further, let's once again show our appreciation to our band today, amen. I just enjoy watching them get excited about what God is doing through them in the ministry of music. Um, I always tell people, uh, it's sort of like preaching. Uh, if you don't enjoy what you're doing, don't expect anybody else to enjoy it, amen. Uh, you ought to get just as much out of it uh, as the people who listen and who are part of this. I also uh, wanna say a couple other things before we go to the sermon. One is that I wanna thank uh, uh, the Reverend Ronnie Collins and the Witness team for leading us for this weekend. Let's show them some love as we will, please. I don't know how many of you are aware, but there are persons who are watching us by live streaming while we're here. Uh, not only that, but I'm understanding that there's been some uh, Twittering going back and forth and some Facebooking as well. Uh, there have even been comments uh, when Bob Pearson was giving his presentation and we said to him, make sure you repeat the questions. The reason we did that is because people were either Twittering or tweeting or how they tweeting back and Facebooking and saying, we can't hear what the questions are, so have the presenter to repeat the questions. So I don't know how many people are watching, but we wanna thank those of you who are not only here uh, with us present, but who are watching us by uh, live streaming because uh, even though we've had somewhere, I hear it numbers from 350 to 400 people who've been a part of this weekend, we already know that it's reaching beyond this room. Uh, we also know that it's reaching even beyond the borders of Holston. Bob Pearson has already committed himself uh, to having the, uh, the clergy members of the uh, Oklahoma Conference to be uh, praying with us. Uh, he's also challenged his bishop, uh, Bob Hayes, uh, uh, to follow in our footsteps and to do likewise. And I just believe God is trying to say something to us about what it is that God really wants us to do and to be a part of. So uh, we want to thank those of you who are watching us um, by live streaming for being a part of this. One other thing I want to do. How many of you are here today not by yourself? Will you stand? I, I want all the folk who came in teams, I want you to stand. If you came in teams from your church, I want you to stand. Amen. Now, let's just look around the room. Now, preachers, I want you to understand that you do not go back without uh, armor bearers. Amen. With persons who can help you to take this message back home. It is so important. The reason I want to point this out it is so important that we preachers quit trying to fight these battles by ourselves, that we learn and understand that we are in this thing together. Amen? Let's give God a hand of praise. Thank you so much. Man. I think more and more of the events, the learning opportunities, and the worship opportunities, and I call them sort of our pep rallies, amen, that, that we have in the life of this annual conference and in our districts and in our, uh, our sub-district meetings, more and more of them need to be events in which there are clergy and laity together so that we can all get excited about it uh, so that when you go back home, at least you'll have one person who knows what you're talking about, amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles uh, and you care to follow along with me, I want to read, uh, maybe a little strange uh, for me to go to this, um, this text, uh, but uh, I just really feel led to do it. I want to go to the Old Testament, to the book of Joshua, uh, chapter 14, and I want to begin reading at verse number 6. Joshua, uh, chapter 14, beginning with verse number six, and uh, even though I told you to sit down, I want you to please stand. 
Yeah, that is kind of Methodist, isn't it? <laughs> Up and down. <laughs> okay. Um, hear this, the word of the Lord from Joshua chapter 14, beginning at verse number six. Uh, then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him an honest report. But my companions who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day saying, surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever because you have wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. And now as you see, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, which Israel, while, excuse me, while Israel was journeying through the wilderness. And here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was on the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then for war and for going and coming. So now come and give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there with great fortified cities. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall drive them out as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed him and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an inheritance. So Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day, because he wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. The word of God for us, the people of God. You may be seated. And now, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you indeed are our strength, and we bless you, dear God, that you are our Redeemer. And now may the words spoken here not be James Swanson's words, but may they be words that come from you and words that find a place, a fertile place within our hearts. And may that word take root and may it begin to grow and may it blossom and may it produce fruit that bless your name. For it is in Christ Jesus' name we pray. May we all say amen. amen. I love this passage of scripture. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm so in love with it I really do believe that in the pilgrimage, the journey of the people called United Methodists, we can find a kind of kindred moment with Caleb. If you heard the scripture lesson or if you've heard it before, you recognize that it's been about 45 years since Caleb has been able to view the land that was promised to him. But earlier, he and Joshua, along with 10 other persons, had been sent into this particular portion of the land of promise by Moses to check it out and to see whether or not it was what God had promised them, a land flowing with milk and honey, a place where they could raise their children and their grandchildren in the fear and admonition of the Lord and where their lives would be fruitful and blessed as they served and obeyed God. And I can remember, or at least I really would think that Caleb would, if he was here today, 
would say to us that when I first saw the land, I felt my heart leap within my chest because I knew that I was one of the first of the people to come out of slavery to actually see this land that God had promised me and to know in my heart that this God that had delivered us out of Egypt was carrying us to a place of abundance. And I can just imagine the joy in this man's heart 45 years earlier. And then to go back, Lord, oh, isn't that something? You know, it's almost like uh, what you have probably experienced this weekend and how you have experienced other learning opportunities where you have gone to places and somebody under the anointing of God has poured out their hearts to you and you caught fire and got so excited about what you had heard and you could just with your mind's eye see what could happen in the places where you have been called to live and to serve God. You could see them blooming, sort of like a rose, growing up in the, right through the concrete in the midst of the Spanish Harlem. You could just see a, 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 a spring of water running in the midst of the desert and, and on the way home, it was as if even if your car was one of those cars uh, in which you had to, to travel on a hope and a prayer, amen where well, you were driving on Maypop ties, you know, Maypop any minute, uh, uh, on your way back home, and yet it felt like you were soaring on the eagle's wings because you had gotten so excited about what was happening here and the possibilities for what could happen back home. But oh, when Caleb and Joshua got back, it was amazing that there were 12 people who saw the land, amen? But it was amazing how different the report was when they got back. 12 folk saw the same thing, and yet only two of them were able to close their eyes and to see the land, not through their eyes, but to see the land through the eyes of God. But 10 others were so concerned about rational challenges and rational problems that they failed to see that in the midst of the challenge, there stood a God who was able. Come on, give God a hand of praise in here. How often we go to things like this. And we get so excited about the possibilities and we sit here and we fight the demons that sit on our shoulders and whisper in our ears and, and, and tell us, I don't know why you even came. You know it's not going to happen back at your church. And you fight through it all. And, and, and the reason you're able to, to get through it is that all of the prayers that are being prayed in this place and other places and, and, and the preachers who believe what they're saying and the, the laity who believe what is being said and the music is playing and you get all pumped up. And some of you, a man who have never had a beat any faster than amazing grace, all of a sudden, Lord have mercy, you begin to even clap on time. And so you go back home excited about what you have seen, what you have heard, most of all what your heart has felt, only to arrive back to a skeptic audience, audience where most of us are more or have our, our antenna or our receiving part of our lives more attuned to why we cannot than to why we can. And so we go back to that. And that's what the reality is that you're gonna face when you leave here. Because now you're amongst people who are all excited and you're feeding off of each other's fire. Isn't it good, amen? Don't you feel like Peter, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration? I mean, they were there, and, and I love that part of the scripture where it said that Peter was so excited, he didn't know what to say. So he just said, let's build three booths and let's stay up here and worship. Amen. And I know some of you, even though you don't care too much for Knoxville, amen. 
might be even saying to yourself, it would be good if we could just tarry here just a little while longer. But my brothers and sisters, we must now come down off of this mountain and go back to the places where we serve. And my question to you is what message will you carry back? What message will the people back in your places hear? And not only what messages will they hear with their ears, because I, I must admit something that maybe in just in my old age I'm, I'm beginning to, 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 to understand and to know. I'm not as much concerned with us understanding stuff. The X's and the O's and, and, and the plans and all that. I'm more concerned with what are we feeling in our hearts. Is there something beating deep inside of you? that will move you past this whole idea of having to have everything worked out and having it all properly documented before you move forward. In fact, I am really convinced, I, I, I must be honest, Mike Smith, I'm convinced that part of the problem with us Methodists is that God gives rallies like this and opportunities like this to build momentum. And, and, and what we do is we go home and we spend the rest of the time deconstructing the momentum. And then when we finally get on board, the idea and the movement that God planned for us is way down the river. And if we would have got on board then, we could have laid back and just coasted on the waves. Now we got to go build a motorboat to catch up with where God is going. Come on, give God some praise in here. So part of what you're gonna have to deal with when you get back home, is how do I carry not only the information, because hear me, information is not, it, it is not the thing that's gonna save us and the United Methodist Church. Y'all need to hear me on this. It is nothing but the Spirit of God that's gonna save this church and revitalize this church and move us into an era of prosperity. It will only come when we stop worrying about things we cannot fix, do what we can, and leave the rest in the hands of Almighty God. Give him some praise. Oh, bless his name. But in the midst of my enthusiasm and this, this thing that's been eaten all inside of me, amen, let, let me try to help you with some of this because when we look at Caleb, I think Caleb says something to us that, that we need to hear. And, 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 and the interesting thing is that Rudy and Bob kept saying, and I kept saying, shh, you're giving away my points, amen. <laughs> uh, but, but, they're, but they're right. One of those is that Caleb was clear on his vision, very clear. He said 45 years ago, Moses promised me this land. I can just see him. David, I can just see him going to sleep every night. And, and, and if he would have had, you know, cell phone with picture capabilities back then, I'm almost sure he would have taken a snapshot of it. And, and, and every night he would have pulled that picture out. And before he went to sleep, he would have had a word of prayer and kissed that picture and say, one a day, man, them going to be my grapes. That's going to be my hillside. And he would tuck that picture underneath his pillow and go to sleep knowing that somehow and some way, even though we are wandering through this wilderness, God is going to give me what God has promised me. I mean, this, this thing was so a part of him that, that he couldn't wait when it got time to divide the land. He went straight to Joshua and said, wait a minute, hold up, hold up, hold up, wait a minute. Let, before you get to giving out land, let me remind you of the promise that God made to me through his servant Moses. He told me where my feet have trodden, that shall be my land. I wonder how many of you here have trodden a land, have walked on a land, maybe even in your dream or, or, or maybe as you daydreamed. Have you ever walked into your church 
and, and looked at the empty pews and, 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 and stood at the front of the church or at the back of the church and envisioned that church filled with people, with children laughing and with men and women giving themselves in marriage and, and seeing broken homes put back together, seeing folk healed and set free and delivered from sin and destruction. Have you ever seen uh, the parking lot that wasn't even built just yet and folk coming from miles around? I, I wonder if your vision is clear. Have you even seen it before it happened? Let me tell you a story. Some of you are aware of the miracle of Africa University. Amen. Africa University was started in, in the first class was in 1992. And that university has become one of the greatest universities in all the world now, graduating uh, uh, thousands of young men and women who are going off to bless the world. But what folk don't know about that is back in about 1880, 1890, there was a missionary bishop of all people, amen. Who, who was in that area of old Mutari, who stood up on a mountaintop and looked down into the valley where Africa University is right now. And he said, I have this vision of Africans coming from every country on this continent and coming to this place to learn about God and to learn how to live with one another in peace and in prosperity. And in 1992, a hundred years after his vision, God made it come true. Come on, give God a hand of praise. Oh, bless his name in this house. You need to be clear when you go back home. What is your vision for the places where you are? And another thing, just a kind of an addendum to that that I just want to stick in there. Quit making your vision so small unless you serve a small God. Quit making your vision fit what you think you can do. Give God a chance to show you that God can take nothing and make something out of it. That the God we serve can step out on nothing and create this earth and you and I can take mud and make humankind that we now populate this whole world. Don't tell me that there are any limits on the God we serve. We got to quit this stuff of having such a small God and a small mind. I serve a mighty God who can do all things. Oh, bless his holy name. Ah, oh, my Lord. I, I keep forgetting we have, more tra we have some traditionalists in here. I need to be cool, amen. <laughs> set some immediate goals. And, 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 and this, after you set this, this vision and make it clear, get some immediate goals. In other words, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. That's all I'm asking you to do, is to go back home and start with some immediate goals. Let, let me give you one. First of all, if your church is not growing, go to the nominations, what well, the lay leadership committee, yeah. It just shows you how long I've been out of the local church. <laughs> go to the lay leadership committee and tell them, to get rid of the evangelism committee. Oh, I'm serious about it. I'm serious about that. Because if your church is not growing, duh. Come on, y'all. Come on. If your church is not winning people to Christ, your evangelism committee is not doing its job. Come on. And it's an impossible job you gave them because you told them to go out and win folk without your cooperation without you doing anything at all, but sitting on the sidelines. And, 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 and part of this is understanding the reality of the fact that all of us are called to witness. All of us are called to tell our story. And it's so simple, it is so easy. I don't know why we made this thing so hard. It's amazing how folk can sit and talk about the last episode as the world turns and can't talk about the man who set the world to turn in. It's amazing to me how we can talk about all kinds of stuff about who won the soccer game instead of talking about the God who let your children play soccer and never be hurt. Come on up in here, Jesus. 
It is amazing how easy it is to set some immediate goals. And what those of you who came in teams, the reason I asked you to stand, I hope you will take advantage of, where, where's Rebecca Fetzer? So where are you, Rebecca? You still in here? Can we have 30 minutes after this is over for folks to just kind of hang around? All right. I, I hope you will hang around and, and, and with your team and make some plans before you leave here and start talking about what are we going to do when we get back home? What is our strategy that we're going to employ? Because if you, I believe what I've seen in here and what I've heard in here, you've all echoed the sentiments that God is doing something. Well, if God is doing something, don't you want to be in the business of cooperating with God? Come on, give him some praise if that's what you want to do. Meet with this group and don't just meet with them here when you get back home. Y'all better talk to each other again. Y'all rode all the way here on the van. Y'all gonna ride all the way back on the van and say, oh, the bishop preached too long. That's all right, amen. <laughs> talk about something else. What is it that God called me here for these two days to begin to think? Set some immediate goals. Now let me see where else I'm supposed to go. Amen. I done got so excited here. Expect, hear this, expect some opposition. Expect some opposition. Just know everybody's not going to be happy about this. Oh, no, 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 no. Because nobody's going to be happy about the fact that y'all really get to work it and, 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 and really believe this stuff and go out and tell folk about Jesus and they show up in your church. Nobody's going to be happy that when they show up that their favorite parking spot's going to be gone. <laughs> Amen, y'all. They're not going to be happy about that at all. They're not going to be happy about the fact that somebody's going to join the choir who's got a better soprano voice than the lead soprano. Oh, I'm going to make it real plain. See, nobody is going to be happy about the fact that somebody is going to join the church, amen, who's going to start a Sunday school class that outstrips the Sunday school class you already have. See, nobody's going to be happy about that. And, and, and don't expect the devil to throw a big party for you. You know, don't expect folk who never wanted to do something to all of a sudden be happy about doing something. Just expect some opposition. That's why I tell you the group you came with needs to be your prayer group where you all pray. And if the preacher, amen, is trying more to please the opposition than he is trying to, she's trying to please what God is doing, then you go into their study on Sunday morning and you tie them down in their chair and anoint them with all and you pray for them that God will set them free, that they might lead God's people where God wants them to go. Come on, give God some praise in this house. Oh, bless his name. I know, my preachers, I know we get scared, amen, because we hear all of this noise. But preachers, let me give you a, let me give you a word, too. When they come to you and they say, we've been talking. <laughs> First question ought to come out of your mouth is name the we. <laughs> Who are the we? Well, they don't want to be known. Well, if they don't want to be known, they really must don't want me to take them serious. Tell me who do we are? Well, me and my wife and the dog, amen. <laughs> we was talking and the dog was barking, amen. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Some of us are hearing sounds of opposition that's not there. But you need to expect the opposition is gonna come. You need to know that everybody's not gonna be happy about being inconvenienced. But I'll tell you something that I've learned over the years, and that is when we've worked in the church and did it anyhow. Y'all ever done anything anyhow? It's, it's the amazing thing when you do it anyhow, how the people who were the most vocal critics, when it's over and done with, when the numbers swell, or when the fellowship hall is completed, or, or the new parsonage is purchased, they're the first somebody to want to volunteer to be the host or the hostess to show the new building off, or to tell everybody about all the folk they are bringing into the church. My brothers and sisters just need to know there are some folk who will talk us, they just not walk us. Come on, give God a hand of praise. Oh, bless his name. Everybody's not going to 
Be happy. Expect some opposition. And now I think I want to close because uh, we're getting close to time, and I don't want to get uh, all these folk upset, amen, who worried about time. Not only do you want to expect some opposition, not only do you want to set some immediate goals and be clear on your vision, but you better learn to count on God to be there with you. You need to understand and know that God never gives a vision without provision. God never leads you to a place that God hadn't already scouted out. Y'all remember the scripture where it says that, that God was in Jesus Christ reconciling the world even before the foundation of the world was created? Y all, y all, y all, have y'all heard that? Which means, as my great preacher who I've heard in the Bahamas by the name of Miles Monroe would say it, Miles said, what we really fail to hear in the scripture is the fact that what God did was that God stepped into the future and God resurrected Jesus. And then God did the moonwalk. <laughs> backed up and put him in the tomb. And then God did some more moonwalking. He backed up and they were taking him down off the cross. God backed up and there he was hanging on the cross from the ninth to the sixth hour. Got to back it up, amen. And then he backed him all the way up and, and he saw him healing the sick and raising the dead. God backed him all the way up and there he was, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and in Bethlehem. That's why God wasn't worried about whether or not his son would be crucified. He already made the resurrection take place. Come on, hey, bless his holy name. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, bless his name. God is with us. Repeat these words after me. God, God. come on, y'all say it like you mean it. God, God. Is, is with us. With us. Come on, God, God. Is, is with us. Come on, give God some praise in this house. Y'all clap on the live streaming too, amen. Oh, bless his name. It's already. Ronnie a done deal. God has already baptized them folk. Pentecost and already happened in heaven. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? It's a done deal. What we've got to do is to get in the plan with God and somehow find a way to hope amidst people who are caught in despair because God is with us. Let me close with this. Can you really imagine, Caleb, 85 years old? Any 85 year olds in here who care to admit it, amen? <laughs> amen. Not, not far, amen. That's, that's, that's all right, baby. Please, I'm hoping to get there. Will you tell me, give me the report before I get there, let me know what, what to expect, okay? Amen, I'm serious about it. I just turned 60 this year, and buddy, if I'd have known it was this good, I'd have turned 60 a long time ago. Yes, sir. I finally got some sense at 60. It took me that long. Listen, listen. Can you see that 85 year old man? He said, My strength. Hallelujah. Today is what it was 45 years ago. Now, some of us may not be able to say that. Not physical strength. But I hope you leave here today and your faith in God and in the church is as strong today as it was the day you laid on the chancel rail and cried your eyes out because you came to know Jesus in the free pardon of your sins. Or is it strong today as when the pastor led you through confirmation class and you believed in your heart you were on the right road. I hope your faith is so strong that when you go back home, that when all of the opposition comes against you, 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 you'll just kind of brush them off and pack it under your feet. And, in, and instead of it being uh, stumbling blocks, you're using for stepping stones. And, and every round will carry you a little high. I hope your faith is, is so great that you'll be able to see that God never intended for us, never intended for us as a United Methodist Church to be in this almost 45-year decline. God never intended that. But I'll tell you something. God can use it to spark a fire in our hearts. 
that will begin another round of revival within the hearts and minds of people who have yet to come, have yet to hear, and have yet to see. Caleb knew, Steve, it was his land. He knew it. Y'all have got to know that those 3,000 folk out there are just waiting on you. And what y'all ought to be doing is chomping at the bit, not to get home to beat the snow, amen, but to get out there and to use what you have learned so that other people can be with you. Let me end with this. I've often thought about this, Amy, I, and I, I'm, I have to confess something. I, mean, I hate to do this, but confession is even good for the bishop, amen. I like to party. Anybody else in here like to party would be willing to admit it. Amen. Come on, Betsy. I know you like to party. I know you do. Amen. I love to party. Amen. Even if I can't dance like I used to, I love to party. I, I mean, I love, I, I just love it. Even when my children would have birthday parties. Amen. I'd be there just like that with them. And when, and when I remember when Josh was one years old and we, we, we had a, a chocolate cake for his, for his birthday. And I remember him putting his hand in it. And putting it on. I said, <laughs> but partying by yourself is no fun. It's really no fun. Come on, y'all. Some of y'all are aware that I'm trying to lose weight, amen. But well, my family bought me one of those We Fit Plus DVDs that's on the Wii. Y'all need to get one, amen. If you're fighting the battle of the budge the way I am, I'm just telling you. And, and there's one thing on there. That's called, um, how is it, uh, basic step. And, and, and man, you go, and you got to get it. And you, and you get so many points, you know. And me and Miss Swanson, we battling, you know, because she'll get 300. I said, I got to get 301, amen. And I'm, I mean, I'm just really at this thing. But even on the Wii Fit, the one thing I had just realized, very seldom, very seldom are you doing anything by yourself. Even the part where I be running, I be getting down. And somebody passed me, I try to run fast. <laughs> but all along the route, there are little other little knees. And they're waving <laughs> as you go by. And I'm going, <laughs> look at me, you know. And when you get to the finish line, they all jump. Oh, you did it. And, and halfway through, they're saying, you halfway, keep on. You can do it. And I'm sweating, them, but I'm going to get it because I'm hearing all of these words of encouragement. Brothers and sisters, when we finish this race, and even all along the route, you ought to look around this room before you leave here. And when you get tired, and when the committees wear you out, and when you're about to give up, you ought to see some of these folk on the sidelines say, come on, we can get this thing done. We're in this together. And as we keep running this race, one day the race will be over. Oh, yes, it will. I believe it's going to be over. And, and, and the thing is, when I get to the end of the finish line, as much as I enjoy all the other little me's and, and hollering about encouragement, I, I'm not looking for any of them. I'm looking for a man by the name of Jesus at the end of the finish line. And I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. I decided 45 years ago I was going to bless this conference and thanks be to God, you got the job done. Hey, give him some praise. Oh, bless his name. Bless his name. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Wonderful Savior. Oh, we love you so much, God. Yes, we do. Where my band? Where my band? Where my band? Where my band? Amen. I mean, where my band? Larry, you know better than that. Come on out of here. Amen. You know black preachers love music. Amen. We love it. Ain't that right, Edward Ellis? Don't we love it? We, we, we got to come home with it. Amen. See, if, if he was right, you'd be going, like, 
right back there. <laughs> Listen, you're getting ready to leave. But I don't want you to forget you have a challenge. That God, a gauntlet that God has thrown down. It's time to quit talking and go to walking. It's time to quit bemoaning the losses in the United Methodist Church, blaming this one and that one and saying who didn't do what they were supposed to do. I told Ann Travis this, and I understand it because she's a staff worker with a tremendous amount of responsibility upon her shoulders. When the numbers first came in, it was like 88 or 89, and she said, oh, that's, I was hoping for more than that. And I said, please, Ann, we got more than Jesus had. <laughs> Fact of the matter, Jesus.